Good morning, Tanglewood. Good morning. Some, some of y'all already got the clue. Let's stand up and sing Almighty.
church morning oh let's act like we're alive good morning church good morning there you are I want to welcome those who are watching online this morning as well uh men's men's life we meet tomorrow at two o'clock in the community room ladies your bible study is tuesday morning at 10 o'clock in the community room uh there is a new mission this month church if you noticed out in the foyer there are some cases of water out there so if you look in your bulletin, you'll see August giving opportunities uh, for New Testament church. We're looking for a case of water or two to give donation to water. As hot as it has been, these ministries that, uh, that feed folks and take care of folks are running low on water. And so uh, our mission is going to be to help them to do that. Now, having said that, some of you will not be able to carry cases of water. I get that. So if you want to bring in a six-pack of water, 12-pack of water, or a case of water, that's fine. If you need help getting it from your vehicle into the church, if you'll pull up out front, tell somebody, I got water, then we'll make sure somebody will haul that water inside for you so you don't have to do that. But let's uh, do our best to be faithful to help these ministries with those uh, water donations. Let me ask you a question. The topic comes up, the opportunity arises, and you get stuck not knowing how to share your faith. Maybe it's a fear of rejection. Maybe it's, I don't know what scriptures to use. Maybe it's, I don't know how to share my testimony with somebody. If that's you, we've got good news for you. Coming in September, we're going to be starting a witnessing class. It'll be a six-week class. It'll be a combination of you doing a Bible study, and there'll be a video session on there. And so it'll be six weeks of teaching you and I how to share our faith. So if you would like to be a part of that, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table back there. Make sure that you sign up early so that we know how many books to order for you, and uh, we'll make sure we get that taken care of. All right? So I'm hoping that, uh, that we'll have a big turnout for that because you and I ought to be concerned with having the comfort and the confidence, being able to share our faith anytime, anywhere, with anyone. And that's what the Bible tells us to do. Always be ready to have an answer for the hope that you have. Uh, when someone is in, when you encounter someone who needs that. All right, we had a memory verse last week. Our memory verse last week was uh, Matthew 6, verse 13. And it, we talked about, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the bottom of your inside cover of your bulletin, you'll see today's, this week's list, uh, memory verse. This week's memory verse is Proverbs 22 and verse 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. Let's say that one together. Ready? Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. Somebody's asked one time, so, Pastor, why do you do the memory verse then? 
because it's just as important to get God's Word into us as it is for us to get into God's Word. We want to make sure we hide His Word in our hearts and minds. All right, let's get ready to worship this morning. Join me, if you would, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive from God what He has prepared for us. Gracious Father, we love you this morning. We are so grateful for the opportunity to be able to be in a place where we can sing praises to your name, where we can exalt the name of Jesus, give you the honor and the glory that you deserve. And so, Father, this morning, as we acknowledge your holiness and that we, Father, are standing on holy ground in this place, we gather together, Father, as children around the feet of our fathers, looking to glean from your word and gather every word into our hearts and our minds. So, Father, right now, we ask you to help us to prepare our hearts and our minds. Remove the distractions. Father, give us a focus upon you and you only. As we sing to you the praises this morning, may we see you high and lifted up on your holy throne. May we sing to you as an audience of one, singing out, Father, with all of our heart and all of our might to love you, to worship you, and to honor you. And then, Father, as we partake of your word this morning, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and speak your word right into our hearts. Put it in our hearts, Father, plant it like a seed that can take root so it will transform our lives forever. So we'll look more like Jesus every day, than, more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. And as we grow and mature in our faith, Father, you'll receive the honor and the glory and we'll be the witness that we need to be for our community, our friends, and our family. So take this time and use it for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Worship team, come lead us this morning. Well, you're singing good this morning. Keep it up, all right?
scripture says in Philippians 3 8, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. I'd rather have Jesus. God's word tells us in Psalm 62, 6, He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Psalm 62, 6 again. Folks, all the turmoil going on in the world, if the mountains fall into the sea, the Lord's still the same. He still reigns. He's still sovereign. So we stand on that, on his word.
And if you've got your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22. If you're not familiar with Bible study, Proverbs is the book right after Psalms, and Psalms is about the middle of your Bible. So stick your thumb in the middle of your Bible, pop it open, and hang a right. Proverbs, chapter 22. Fewer books in the Bible than you would imagine have a clear statement of their purpose and why they are written. But Proverbs is one of those books that has a clearly stated purpose. The book of Proverbs is written to us to know wisdom and to know instruction. And in the Old Testament, uh, we are told that Solomon wrote a lot of Proverbs. In fact, we know he's written over 3,000 Proverbs. We have here in the book of Proverbs uh, about 800 of them. And uh, through, though Solomon did not write all the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, uh, we see that others have contributed to his wisdom and to his wisdom book which tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of god given to us by the holy spirit so they're all trustworthy but ultimately this collection of proverbs is designed to help the reader acquire the discipline for a prudent life 
doing what is right, doing what is just, doing what is fair. Isn't that what the prophet told us, that God, what, is, what does God require of us? But to love mercy and justice, to, to do what is right, to do what is fair. Proverbs is probably the most intensely practical book of the Old Testament because it teaches skillful living at multiple levels, if you will, and different aspects of life. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be turning to the book of Proverbs, that wisdom book of the Old Testament, to gain instructions for this game we call life. We're going to be looking at several different aspects of living and, and what does the Word of God instruct us to do and how should we be living for the Lord. <coughs> we're looking for daily wisdom for daily living. Wisdom, the wisdom of Proverbs instructs us on how to have a, uh, a right life. And the, it begins, the, the message I want to bring to us today is it begins with this pursuit. Uh, we pursue a lot of things in life. You and I run after all kinds of things. A lot of people run after fame and fortune and money and, and secure futures and all those types of things. But in this particular passage, the Solomon tells us in Proverbs 22 and verse 1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. Proverbs, uh, Proverbs tells us and Solomon tells us that a good name or character, if you will, is to be one of our top pursuits in life. It's to be a, a pursuit over money, over riches, over security, over fame. You and I are to be concerned with our name with our reputation, with our character, who we really are as individuals and as people of God. So this morning, I want to give us three simple steps to earning and keeping a good name. So if you've got your listening guys handy, I want to point out the very first thing. The very first thing is that it's got to be a desire for a good name or a, a good reputation. And, and Solomon says again, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. I read this week about three preachers who were in a coffee shop, and they were talking about when life begins. One of the preachers gave the opinion, he said, well, uh, life begins when the child is born and takes its first breath. The other preacher, second preacher, said, well, I don't agree with that. He said, I think the life begins at conception. The per third preacher said, well, I understand where both of you are coming from. He said, but let me tell you why both of you are wrong. He said, life begins when the oldest child moves out and the dog dies. Now, that's a funny story, but, the, but you and I understand what they're saying. Life, by the way, does begin at conception, but outside of the womb, life begins with a name. And the real question then becomes, what is in a name? What difference does a name make? Why is Solomon telling us that one of our top pursuits in life ought to be to have a good name, a, a good reputation? And the fact is that the Israelites in the Bible times, who this proverb was written to, uh, these people had a name that had significance. Names meant more then than they do today. Uh, names had a particular purpose back then. Uh, notice that the, the appeal of Solomon here is that while there are many things that we might pursue, the greatest thing we can pursue is a, a good name and, and a name that, that brings favor to those who mention our name. Names are given for a purpose. Uh, they, for example, let me just give you some examples through Scripture. Sometimes a name was given in connection with the happenings at the child's birth. Sometimes a name was given to coincide with the joy or the sorrow of that particular parent. Sometimes it was an expression of hope for the future of the child. Sometimes God directed the parents to give the name to the child as a form of prophecy and would somehow inform the parents of the role the child would play in that coming prophecy. Sometimes a person of power could then give a new name to someone who is in authority and uh, as an indication of a blessing or an honor. Sometimes a new name was given to indicate a person's character. We saw that in the story of Jacob, who was, his name was changed to Israel. So where there's a connection here between the name and the character, the, the, to know the name is to know the character. To know the name of the person is to desire to know who or what that person is really is all about. It's, it's, to, it's an identification. Now, let me just put it to you in practical sense. When somebody says your name, they have an image in their mind. They have thoughts in their mind. They have opinions that come to their mind. They have ideas 
about you because your name sparks an idea about who you are, who you are to them, who they, what they think about you and who, how they think about you. Your name is associated with who you are. So when someone says your name, they're thinking not about just a name, but they're thinking about the person themselves. And so as it was then, it is today. Uh, names meant the person. Those who honored the name, honored the person. Those who dishonored the name, dishonored the person. And, and according to this, biblical, this common biblical usage, uh, it, it, uh, to, to make a person's name known meant to make their character or their activity known. In other words, I, if I said your name back then, I was saying, well, I know who you are, I know what you're about, and I pretty much know what I can expect from you because I've been watching your activity. Frankly speaking, we can talk about this just bluntly this morning. I'm going to tell you right now, character has been taking a beating in the church and in the country for several decades now. We've been told, we've been taught through the words and actions of many character isn't important, or at least character is not as important as things like power, economy, global warming. Those are the things we're told today that count. Those are not the things that count. Character counts. Character matters. It used to be that you could go down to the, and I know I'm talking and dating myself years and years and years ago, but it used to be you could go down to the hardware store with a shake of a hand, you could buy a lawnmower. <laughs> you couldn't do that today. Why? Because people's word is not what it used to be. Uh, character used to be, if I give you my word, my word is my bond. If I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. If I say I can't do it, I, I can't do it. But my word stood for something. But that's not the way it is today. In, in fact, uh, uh, character counts so much for you and I. I mean, you and I ought to be able to expect character to count in our national leaders. We ought to be able to count, say that character counts in those who sit in judgment of the laws of our country. We ought to be able to say that character counts for those who hold office in our state. Character counts for those who, uh, who are holding office in our cities. Character counts for those who ought to be in leadership roles in our church. Character counts in those teaching our children and our grandchildren what they ought to be learning in schools and in universities. Characters count, character counts when it comes to leading our families. Character counts to God, and it ought to count for you and I. And as God's people, you and I ought to say, well, if, if character is an issue for God, it ought to be an issue for me. As, it, as God's children, as God's representatives, and according to our text this morning, a good name is to be greatly admired and preferred over riches. We should protect our good name. We should seek, every one of us in this place and those watching online, it ought to matter what people think about us. It ought to matter. Now, now, I used to teach high school when I was by vocational ministry, and, and, uh, and I coached sports. And the high school kids and, and middle school kids in particular, they, they'd always get all unraveled about, well, people are looking at me and people are talking about me. And my solution was always the same to them. That's good. That's a good thing. Give them something to look at and something to talk about. Make sure that you are giving them a good thing to look at and a good thing to talk about because they're going to look. And they're going to talk. And you and I ought to be aware of the fact that, that people are going to look at us and listen to us. And sometimes they're looking at us and listening to us and we don't even know they are. And we ought to be concerned about the, having a spotless reputation. In other words, Scripture is telling us when we come to a good name, it matters how we live. It, it matters how we treat people. It matters the words that come out of our mouth. It matters the way that we approach people. Until character is brought back to the forefront, things are never going to change in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, in our nation. They're never going to improve. Until God's people say, you know what? If God is concerned about my reputation, maybe I ought to be concerned about my reputation. If God is concerned about my name, maybe I ought to be concerned about my name. And, and the truth is, we should be. That once again, we ought to be insisting upon and expecting things. It's okay to have expectations. Uh, when I have premarital counseling or, or marital counseling with people, uh, you ask people, you say, you know, what do you think is the number one cause for divorce? And people will say, well, sex and money. That's always the two go-tos. And, and I've got a, a, a theory about that. I think that the number one cause of divorce today 
is unmet or unfair expectation. You know what an unfair expectation is? An unfair expectation is anything that has not clearly been stated and agreed upon. And so if you've got expectations of somebody that you have not discussed it with, and you've not set that forth, and you've not agreed upon it, that is an unfair expectation. And you can expect that expectation not to be met. And when that expectation is not met, we start doing a thing called keeping score. And then we get into marital counseling, and people get historical. I'm not talking about hysterical. I'm talking about historical. The scorecards come out. And we talk about all the things and all the times and all the issues of these unfair expectations. It's okay to have expectations. And you and I, as children of God, based on our lives upon the authority and the word of God, are okay to have some expectations. We ought to begin to expect to, to uh, have honesty and integrity in ourselves and in our leaders. We ought to expect to have fidelity in marriages. We ought to expect to, again bring back a moral standard that is opposed to making everything about rights and no responsibility. We ought to begin to expect people to abstain from alcohol and drug abuse. We have the right to expect people to live godly lives. And by the way, it begins with the house of God and the people of God. And the fact of the matter is, if we don't expect people to live godly lives, why in the world are we standing back and amazed that they don't? Someone rightly said, people have this tendency to live up or down to our expectations of them. There's an old cemetery in Winchester, Virginia, that's a Confederate cemetery. There's a monument there, and on that monument is carved these words, who they were, none knows. What they were, we all know. Listen, the, the bottom line is, the truth of the matter is, Far too many, church, listen to me very carefully. Far too many people, including the church, including believers, far too many people today are more concerned with their image than they are with their integrity. That's got to change. The Word of God says that's, that's getting the cart before the horse. That's backwards. As Socrates reminds us, the first and greatest is the thing to greatness is to be really who we appear to be. Well, in short, what I'm saying to you is that character counts. We should desire to build ourselves a good name and represent us well. When we say we're going to do something, we ought to do it. When you tell somebody, I'm going to pray for you, you better be praying for them. You tell somebody you're going to be there, you better be there. You tell somebody that you're going to do something, you ought to do it. If anybody ought to be able to be counted on for integrity and for character, it is the people of God. Because we ought to be just as concerned about our reputation as God is. Well, how do we do it? How do I, how do I build a good name? I can't just desire a good name. There's got to be, notice number two in your outline, there's got to be a development of a good name. And, and Solomon helps us with that. For believers, a good name means a good reputation. And a good reputation is nothing more than the fruit of good character. Character, by the way, is doing what's right just because it's right. We just do what's right because it is right. And, and the good news is that God made us all the same. The same. Look what, uh, what Solomon tells us in verse 2. He said, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Every one of us has the opportunity, the same opportunity, to do the right thing, the right way, because it's right. Every one of us is made the same. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're famous or an introvert, every one of us has the same opportunity to do what is right because we're all made the same. In their book, The Day America Told the Truth, James Patterson and Peter Kim, back in 1991, I want to make this emphasis, back in 1991, found these startling statistics. Now, I know we're living in 2023, so you can imagine what they were then versus what they are now. But in 1991, 90% of Americans surveyed say that, uh, they truly believe in God. That has drastically changed. 84% uh, of those same people said that they would willingly violate the established rules of their religion. 74% of Americans said they would steal from those who wouldn't really miss it. 
64% said they would lie when it suited them. 56% said that they would drink and drive if they felt they could handle it. 53% said that they would cheat on their spouse, and the reason was because they would if they could. 50% said they would do absolutely nothing at work at least one day a year. 48% said that they have no belief for which they would die. 30% said they'd be willing to die for God or some religious belief. But for $10 million or the contract of a sports star, one in four Americans would be willing to do the following. Abandon their church, abandon their family, become a prostitute for at least a week. And even though 78% of high schoolers said they believed cheating is wrong, 61% admitted they'd done it. Is there any wonder character today is taking the beating that it has? We live in a philosophy today where it's only wrong if you get caught. Uh, violence and sex on TV are just mere forms of entertainment. Many today have tried to replace what they lack in character with commodities, and that was 1991. This is 2023. I was uh, happy to hear what Tim Robinson said. He said, don't let yourself be victimized by the age that you live in. It's not the times that will bring you down any more than it's society. We all have individual moral responsibility. None of us, especially those of the household of God, have to play victims to our social circumstances. We have the right and the power to rise above them. He's right. You, you know what limits people? You know what holds people back? Lack of character. And so when the character in God's people and the character of God's church is low, we can expect that the standards everywhere are going to be low. You say, well, Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying it's time the church needs to get back to raising the standard. It's time that you and I as the church and the people of God get back to raising the standard about who we are. Get back to insisting upon godliness and righteous living. Proverbs presents this to us. Listen, we need to get back to desiring a good name, a good reputation, and working to, de to develop it. We go around saying things like this. You know, there are things in life that count. Well, it's been well said that things that count most can't be counted. But you know, that you think about this for just a minute. There are some things that we say that count, but, but we say things like, well, if you've got a house, that counts. What good is a house if you don't have a home? Well, you know, somebody says, well, you know, if, if, uh, if one may lack companions, or not have any lack of companions, you may have a lot of associations, a lot of people that you know, and a lot of acquaintances, but you may not have any real friends. One might have a marriage, not have any love. One might, you may have had a career, but not a life. You may have a spouse and children, but not really a family. But the world says, wait a minute, those are the things that count, but that's not the things that count. There, there, there are things that are far more valuable than earthly treasures, and they are often forfeited so we can obtain those things. But there are stronger things and better things, and uh, this proverb does not oppose wealth, but it implies that wealth ought to be obtained rightly. One who is, has obtained riches at the cost of their character is poorer than the poorest man on earth. It's too high of a price to pay. There was once a man who made a deal. He wanted to obtain some land, to build a house for his family, to farm some land, make some money. And so he said to a man who owned the land, he said, I'd like to do this, and I'd like to have the land. The man said, you meet me here tomorrow morning at sunset, and I'll make you this deal. You walk the land, and wherever the sole of your foot touches, you can obtain that land, and I will give it to you. So the man met him there before the sun rose the next morning, and he started out, and he began to uh, pace himself, and he began to walk off a square that he thought would be appropriate. And as he walked off the square he thought would be appropriate, he came to the point, and he looked up in the sky, and he thought to himself, well, you know what? This is good, but I've still got time. I can... I can obtain even more land if I just hurry my pace a little bit. He began to hurry his pace, and he walked off more land, and he thought to himself, I've got plenty of time. And, and as he did, the, the, did this and hurried his pace, soon the day 
It was beginning to get away from him. And he looked up, and the sun was beginning to go down. And he thought to himself, you know what? I've gone farther than I planned, but if I hurry, I can still complete this task and obtain this land. He had been without food and water all day, and he was feeling a little bit uh, faint, but he knew that he had to get this job done if he was going to get the land. So he rounded the last corner of the square, and then he had walked off. The sun is beginning to go down, and he began to think to himself, if I'm going to make it to the finish line, I'm going to have to sprint. Ignoring the pain in his side and, and the, the agony he was in, he began to run with this goal in mind. As he was getting close, he could see the distance of the landowner's shadow. He pressed on, and he pressed on, and he finally made it with a sprint, and he, just as the sun went down, he lunged over the finish line, rolled over on his back, and looked up into the eyes of the devil. For all of his trouble, he earned a piece of land, eight by four. Solomon said, listen, you've got a lot of things you can pursue in life, but there's one thing that you ought to pursue more than anything, a good name, a good reputation, being known for who you are and be really who you are. Name, a character, reputation, Solomon says, that's far greater than riches, far greater than obtaining silver or gold. There are things in life that we can count on. There are at least two things in life we can count on, Solomon says here, that are more valuable and should be coveted more than great riches. A good name or is to be chosen and loving favor. Those two things are things that you can count on. Those two things are things that are, are, are well worth it. Uh, to be spoken of well is to have a reputation, to be known for being a person of integrity, being a person for being real for who you are. And that's what Solomon is telling us we need, need to do. Listen, it, it's a mistake. It is a mistake if you're under the impression today that you think that you can only make, it, make a name for yourself by having money or having power or playing sports or being a movie star or a music star or in government or business or being popular with folks. If that's your opinion, even a battle hero, Solomon says, that's not how you obtain a good name. No name is more lasting and enduring than the one that represents someone who lives for God and the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is our objective as believers, as followers of Jesus? Isn't our objective to be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? Isn't our objective to show more of Jesus in our life today than we did yesterday? In fact, the Bible tells us that God works through all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then he tells us in the very next verse that his purpose is for us to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so if I'm going to look like Jesus, Jesus was a man with a reputation. Jesus had a name. He had a name as a man of prayer. He had a name as a man of power. He had a name as a man of passion. He had a name that sinners could relate to, that they knew that if they went to him, they'd be met with love and compassion. He was a man of truth who lived to honor his father and, and his father's kingdom. Well, if I'm following Jesus and I want to be like Jesus, I want that kind of name. I want to be known as that kind of a person, that kind of a person that is a, a person of prayer, a person of power, a person of passion, a person who loves sinners and wants to reach out to sinners and bring them into the kingdom. I want to be known as a person of truth who lives and honors my Father's kingdom. And I live for his glory. It was devotion to Christ that, that many are remembered forever. Who would ever remember these 12 disciples that Jesus had if it not had been for them giving up everything and following Jesus? What would have become of the name of Saul of Tarsus if Saul of Tarsus had not become Paul, the missionary of the cross? What of the great rep, uh, reputations of great men of God that we've had in our history and present today? One of the things that can really be counted on in life is a good name a reputation of character, of integrity. Uh, someone has once said, a reputation has more value than riches because a name cannot be replaced easily, not even with a lot of money. It takes a lot of work to build up a name. It doesn't take but one act to tear one down. And trying to replace that name is very difficult and a tough task to do. So the question becomes, well, how, do I, how would I go about 
building a good name. How do I go about building a good reputation? I'm so glad you asked that because Solomon answers that in these next verses. In verse 3, here's what he says. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. In other words, he's saying you've got to, be, you've got to have an absolute standard by which you determine the difference between what is right and what is wrong. A lot of people out there don't, are blurring the line. Well, it could be somewhat right. It could be somewhat wrong. It's either right or it's wrong. And just because a lot of people say it's right doesn't make it right. It's either right or it's wrong. The Word of God is our standard for that. And so you and I have to be able to identify evil, and when we see it, see it choose to avoid it. People with true character don't just choose the rules as they go. They make up the rules before they start. These are the things that govern my life. These are the decisions, and this is how I'm going to make these decisions. They don't ask what is right for me. They ask what is right. And then they take responsibility to do what is right. Secondly, in verse 4, look what he says. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Those who know the Lord recognize that we are accountable to God's standard. We're not making this stuff up as we go. It's not our standards. It's his standards. We're living according to, to God's standards. In verse 5, he tells us thorns and snares are in the way of the uh, uh, perverse. He says to us that those who want to develop a good name are able and must be willing to obey God's word to protect the reputation. Let me just tell you, as a Christian, you carry the name of God with you wherever you go. You're responsible for the name of the Lord wherever you go. You know, You've heard the old cliche, but it's true. You and I may be the only Jesus some people see. You and I may be the only Bible some people read. You and I carry the name and the reputation of Jesus wherever we go with whoever we see. And if you're under the impression as a believer today that you can turn around and say, well, what difference does it make? It's just my reputation. I don't care if I do this or if I do that. It's my reputation that gets hurt. Nothing could be farther from the truth. When you became Christ, when he bought you with a price, when you became no longer your own, but you became the temple of the Holy Spirit, when you represented Jesus Christ here on this earth by becoming one of his, it's not your reputation, it's his reputation, wherever you go. It is him that we represent. Paul put it this way. He said, no matter what you're doing, whether you're eating or drinking, whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter. Do it to the glory of God. Why? Because it's his reputation, not yours. Verse 6, he tells us, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he'll not depart from it. He tells us, listen, it's our responsibility to teach our children that character counts. Church, listen to me. We've got to get back to some basic beliefs and unconditionally say what's right is right what's wrong is wrong truth is not subjective there is but one truth and this is the truth this is the standard this is by this is the plumb line this is how we gauge everything in life and, and i gotta tell you, you know, I, I know there are some popular preachers out there today i'm ashamed to say got very large churches. They're making big bucks, and I'm not here to bash them. I am here to bash this, though. They're out there questioning the authority of God. They're out there trying to ease into making God's word more palatable for today's society. We need to embrace the culture of the day. We need to embrace the, the trends of the day. We need to not be so hard with the word of God that God's word is, needs to be brought more up to date so it can be tolerable. Don't you buy into that lie of the devil. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. We don't need to update the Word of God. We don't need to change the Word of God. We need to change to adjust to the Word of God. This Word is our authority and our guide for living a 
I heard someone one time say that the Bible is just an acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Why is that so important to us? Because character is not what we do. Character is who we are. Dwight O. Moody said, character is what you are in the dark. Real character is made of consistency and choices. Thomas McCure once said this, the measure of a man's real character is what he or she would do if he or she were never found out. Therefore, there must not only be a desire for a good name, must, not only, must we put the work into developing a good name, but lastly, there's got to be a display of a good name. How is character built? Character is built one hour at a time. Day by day, year by year, the same way you grow physically, you grow in your character. If we don't plan to build a good name, you won't do it. Somebody said that, that, uh, that, that planning to fail, or uh, failure to plan is a plan to fail. If you don't plan to build a good name, you'll fail at building a good name. We may fool some folks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. Sometime back, it's been several years ago, I found this uh, interesting letter. It's a fictional letter, but it's a great example, if you will, uh, of how we might have uh, looked at the early disciples who would have been chosen for leadership. It's a, it's a letter that uh, is addressed to Jesus, the son of Joseph, woodcrafter, carpenter shop, Nazareth of Galilee. Here's how the letter goes. Dear sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you've picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken a battery of tests and we have run them through our computers. It is our staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, educational, vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise that you're trying to undertake. They don't have the team concept. In fact, we would suggest that you continue your search for persons with experience and proven capability. It goes on to say, Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has no leadership skills at all. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it's our duty to inform you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, have radical leanings and are registered high manic depressive scores. Now, there's only one candidate that shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness who meets uh, people well and has a keen business mind. He has contacts in high places and is highly motivated and ambitious and responsible. Therefore, we recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. We wish you all the success in your future endeavors. Sincerely, Jordan Management Consultants, Jerusalem, Judea. Well, who was Judas? Judas was a guy who faked it until he couldn't make it. And let me tell you something about character. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. Because people look at us on the outside, and God examines the heart. And in the heart is where character is birthed. You can fake it, or you can desire it, put the work into developing it, and displaying true character. Warren Wiersbe said, if you want to know what people are really like, find out what makes them angry, find out what makes them weep, and find out what makes them laugh. Dear Christian, let me tell you this morning, the Word of God reminds us today a good name, a reputation, a reputation of having character is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. Charles Stanley said this one time, he said, character is the relationship, is to a relationship what oil is to a motor. He said, if you take a car motor apart, you will see all the parts fit together and run together well. But he said, if you don't put oil in there, certain parts of the engine will destroy certain other parts of it. Why? Because of a thing called friction. And the same is true in our relationships. If there is a deficit in our character, 
we'll pay the price in our relationships, in our relationship with our spouse, with our friends, with our children, with our church, with our community. So I got to ask you a question this morning. Who do you want to be? Now, wait before you answer that. Because I didn't ask you, what do you want to accomplish? I asked you, what kind of a person do you want other people to know you are? Who do you want to be in other people's eyes? Who do you want to be known by when your name comes up? What's the image? What's the idea? What's the opinion that comes forth? As you think through this morning, I wonder what kind of person do I want to be? I pray if you're a believer today that the first place you go is to the Lord and you say, Dear Lord, please work on my character and help me shape my private life and my, and, and my public life into a reputation that represents me and you well. Makes me a true representative of Jesus. I desire that. I'm willing to work on it so that I can display that kind of reputation. I pray if you're a believer, that's what you're praying this morning. Because let me just tell you something, believer. Nobody needs to be impressed with you, but we are never more in public than what we are in private. In the dark, it matters. Who you are there is who you really are. That's the place we need to turn the light on and say, who am I, who do I want to be, and how do I get there? Now, I know there's a lot of people listening here today and maybe those who are watching online saying, Pastor, I'm going to tell you, one thing I know for sure in this world, there's just not a lot of people you can trust. There's not a lot of people with integrity. There's not a lot of people with character out there. I probably can name the number of people that I can think of on, on one hand. That may be true. But there is always, if you're looking for somebody to trust, you're looking for somebody with character, there's always one person you can turn to. You can turn to Lord Jesus Christ, who has impeccable character. And you can trust in him to forgive your sins and transform your life. And you can trust in him to become your Lord and your Savior and to lead you into being a better person than the people that you may know. To being a person with a good name and a person with a right character and good reputation. And if you'll turn to him today and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you died on that cross for my sins. I believe you were buried and three days later God raised you from the grave. I trust you today to forgive my sins and to become my Savior and Lord. I commit to follow you with my life. My friends, if you do that, he'll transform your life, beginning with your heart and then with your character. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be known for, being among others? Father, I pray this morning for us as a church. You tell us in your word, Father, that everything begins with the house of God. So today, as your people, may we be more concerned with our responsibility than our rights. May we be more concerned with right than with excuses. And maybe we be more concerned with our integrity instead of our image. Transform us, Father, into people of right character of names worthy of your reputation to represent you and your kingdom will. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. take your communion cups with you. Is there anybody who needs a communion packet? Anybody miss that when you came in the door? Can I get somebody to bring Brian a cup very quick? Pam, thank you. Dave, you got your cup? 
Everybody all right? Okay. If you'll peel back the top layer for your wafer, we'll take that out. Thank you for bringing that. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we look back on this Lord's table, we look back on this time of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We do so in remembrance that Jesus, the man of ultimate character, came from heaven to earth to walk among us, live for us, fulfill for us the law and the commandments and the prophets, and then take for us our sins upon himself and die our substitutionary death on the cross. This morning, as we take this bread, we give thanks for the body he bore and the sacrifice he made. Father, thank you so much that this bread represents to us today the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you for his example. We thank you for his lordship. As we partake in this Lord's Supper this morning and we eat this bread, may we not only remember who he was, May we follow his example. May we submit to his lordship over our lives. We give you thanksgiving for this bread now in Christ's name. Amen. You turn your kit over. Peel back the juice side. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So grateful today we serve a living Savior, a risen Savior. And through his blood that was shed on the cross, his death brought us new life. That life is to be lived for his honor, for his glory. Father, we give you thanksgiving for this juice that represents the blood that flowed on that cross that day that did not cover our sin but wiped it away. His sacrifice was sufficient for all of eternity. But as Jesus laid down his life for us, he gave us new life. And all of us who are in Christ our new creations. The old things are passed away and all things have become new. And with the new comes the opportunity of new character, new reputation, new living for your glory. As we take this juice, we give you thanksgiving for the blood that brought us life. In Christ's name, amen. getting ready to leave and go out in this community this week and close out in our closing song I want to remind us wherever we go whoever we meet we're establishing a reputation we're making a name let's make sure that our focus is on making the name that Christ would be proud of establishing a reputation that Jesus says you better believe it He's, he's one of mine She's one of mine. Those are kingdom people right there living among you. Let's make sure we're living and establishing that kind of name among our community so they know that we can be people like Jesus, have a name like his, a name above every name. Amen? Let our reputation point everyone to Christ as we are being Jesus to those that we meet and sharing Jesus with all those that we meet.
Stand with us as we get ready to close out this morning. Have a great week.